Working with me on the technicals here. Hank, and I uh, guess y'all got your verses. Thank y'all for watching. We're having technical trouble. The first device I started with did not like it. And it was flicker, flicker. And I saw everybody leaving because <laughs> you couldn't watch it. But I think we got something going here. So hopefully we're not flickering anymore. You're literally watching through my iPhone now, okay? So we'll, we'll get something going here. Okay. Whoa. That's going to be head chopped off. Let me, let us deal with a few technical things. Don't leave, okay? <laughs> this is not seeing. It's like way up. Yeah, technical difficulties. Give us a moment. I need, yes, I need something to go underneath this. It's too high. Sonny, if you're there, thanks for your feedback. I needed some feedback help. Well, as long as nothing bumps it, that's almost too much. Is it too tall? Looks great now. Can you clip it in this? Now it's too tall. Something a little yes, thinner. Something a little thinner than that. We're yes. trying to balance an iPhone. That's too tall. Because <laughs> this was too Praise tall. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's better, but guys, you're going to have to get like right on it, okay? Uh, so, but we can see it. So yeah, come on and. Let's let's burn. Let's turn and burn. Do we need to put something else in well, there? That's corner? working. No, we're fine. That's all right. Okay. We're fine. A Good oh, morning. I'm getting pictures of this. We <laughs> we've got a uh, comfort verse uh, for you this week, uh, and it comes from First Thessalonians uh, chapter four, verses sixteen through eighteen. So it's actually comfort verses. Uh, we have make for make the lost time here, right? <laughs> so it says. In verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, for the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And things are pretty weird out there right now. Um, you know, only being able to stream church service, you know, over instead of actually meeting together and in a building and doing stuff. And there's making laws every day to keep people isolated and businesses are closing down. Historical weather is happening in bizarre parts of the world. There's a global pandemic, a pestilence challenging governments and individuals alike. Um, the deaths that are resulting from all this and all these changes are, are having people, for the first time in a long time, consider what happens to them when they die. You know, people are thinking about new things. And um, all of this is to say is we're seeing the birth pangs of the coming of Jesus. And though sometimes it seems discouraging in our worldly view, it brings forth the glory of God for the whole world to see. And uh, these days are precursor to his, to his return. And we should be joyfully waiting for that day that we're caught up in the clouds with our, with our, our family in Christ. Yeah. And we should be watching and waiting with hope, knowing that these hard times now mean the day is close, that we're fully redeemed and united with Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we're just uh, over grateful for your word, Lord, in times like these, to have this, this hope, these instructions, these promises, Lord, um, a hope to look forward to, Lord, to be reunited, to be fully redeemed in you again one day, Lord. And Lord, to, to have prophecy 
there for us to to be able to know what's happening or to at least have something to look forward to or through all this, to see it from a different perspective or to see it from not just our own perspective, our limited perspective, Lord, but to be, to have your Holy Spirit in us to, to give us that hope of being with you again, Lord, being united with our, our family in Christ. And Lord, we're, we're so grateful for, for the comfort and hope that that brings us, Lord. And we pray that each and every person would receive that hope, Lord, that they would receive your spirit so that they would be able to understand these things, Lord. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right. Good morning. Um, our Israel verse for today comes from the book of Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 12. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. You know, as Hank was talking about the hope that we have by prophecy and by the promises of the Lord that we've seen fulfilled in, in the Word of God to the T over history, this verse also is a promise that he will take possession of Judah as his inheritance and will again choose Jerusalem. So the Lord is establishing and will do what he has promised for you, for the Jews, for us, the Gentiles, who are once far off. And as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, ultimately we're praying for the restoration of all things that God had planned. So let's pray together for the apple of God's eye of his heart and that peace be upon our earth. Lord God, we thank you that your promises are true. We thank you that we can trust in your word and your promises and prophecy. God, just help your people, Israel, Lord God, as you prepare for Messiah Jesus to, to come again in the, in the appointed time. We thank you for your perfect timing. We thank you for your peace to be upon Jerusalem and upon her, her walls, Lord God, which means that you will restore all things according to your will, to your inheritance, and to your plan. Help call many souls, Lord God, to repentance, both Jew and Gentile alike. And we thank you, Lord, that you're merciful, that you're good, and that you're faithful, Lord, to your word. We thank you and we give you all the glory for everything good in our lives. Help us during these, this time and this season to walk in it and remain faithful. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Am I rolling on this other one? Nope. Here we go. I can see. Actually, actually works better like that. Okay. Well, we're dealing with all the... Um, we're in James 2, by the way. We're dealing with all the crazy technological things that we've never had to deal with ever before. So just bear with us. I got to turn one thing on real quick so it records. I'm wearing this just for a good recording. And I think it was 10 and 2, the way we did that. Test 1. Two, three. Make sure we're working. Test one, two, three. Yep, we're working. All right. Whew, what a day. <laughs> Thank y'all for being here. We're in James 2. Let me get situated while you flip to James 2. And I actually want you to follow me. If you have a Bible in your home or in your cell phone or anything at all, uh, be in James 2 with me because you need to take God's word for it. I don't want you to take my word for it, Okay. Hank, could you flip that screen around and see if it's actually recording me? Because i got a menu over here. Here we go again with our technicals. Uh, is it looking right? And the record light's on. But... It's, it's recording? The clock's ticking? Yes. Okay. All right, you can flip it back the other way. I just wanted to make sure it was actually going instead of being there we go. something crazy. Okay. Now... We're getting there. Guys, this is how you just do what you can with what you got. You improvise. And hello, Travis. I see Travis just show. I know who's watching. I don't know if you're there watching, but I see who's connected. <laughs> <laughs> this, this sermon may go a little long today um, because there's a lot to talk about. And uh, hey, if it's, 
you're 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 in your easy chair. I mean, you can't drag a lazy boy into the <laughs> where we have church usually, but you can today. So uh, let's get into it. Um, James chapter two. <clears throat> We've been talking. To, James been talking about. Oh, thanks for the heart. Well, I get to see hearts go up now while I'm talking. And somebody, uh, Debbie just gave a heart. Oh, somebody else gave a little something. What is all this? <laughs> this is distracting. <laughs> hearts and little puffs and things going off on my iPhone. You're looking at me through the iPhone here. And <laughs> hey, bring some more love. <clears throat> oh, this is a new one for me. Okay. So James 2, uh, he had been talking before about being careful of uh, temptation, and how, how to avoid temptation and not be in temptation. So we're going to be in that uh, today, a, a furtherance of what he has to say now here in, in James chapter 2. And y'all just deal with my eyes. They're going around because I've, I've got a camera here, here. I've got a camera here. And I have a camera here. So I've got two, and I see two of me. So if I seem like I'm not looking at you, then then so what? Okay. <laughs> We're in uncharted waters, and I'm very, very, what's going on? Okay. Uh, if it's for your entertainment, wonderful. Anyway, James chapter 2, and we got a, just a few of us here is, that, that can be. Um, so thank you all for watching online. I wanted to get the the guys in the church leadership to come here to do their part that you just saw so that we can bring you a good uh, live stream. Uh, I wish everybody could be here. It's not my call. Y'all understand that. So uh, thanks for understanding. And we'll just go ahead and go into James uh, chapter two, which is the sin of favoritism, the sin of favoritism. And let me get myself going here. It's, it's a different feel when you're doing a live stream versus being in front of people. I don't know why. Everybody in the room started getting nervous and why we do this with more people when we're in our usual place. It's just strange. James 2, beware of personal favoritism. He says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Don't have partiality. Interesting that he would say that. First off, James's address, we got to see who he's talking to. He said, my brethren. I, I try to be as observant as I can to what the text is saying, because you got to know who he's talking to, to fully understand what, he, what he's trying to get at us. He says, my brethren. That means he's writing to believers, to believers of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that the, the, the Bible guys write to is for everybody. This is specifically addressed to those who believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, as I got to thinking about this, who he addressed it to, the believers. The Bible says that believers are given spiritual understanding through the Holy Spirit. And so when James addresses my brethren, then he's expecting believers to process what he's saying here he wants them to process this through their Holy Spirit understanding and not just through human logic. So we got to get the logic out of the way and we got to go deep into the spirit. Lord, what are you trying to tell me? So that's why he said, my brethren, he, he's expecting us to go that deep into understanding what he's trying to say. He's expecting us to process it there in the spirit. Now, as flawed people, <laughs> we are prone to doing everything with partiality, don't we? We have preferences on everything, everything there is. What restaurant do you want to go to? I don't know. You know, I'll, I used to ask Anna, what restaurant do you want to go eat at? She goes, well, I don't know. And so I would drive to the one I knew she didn't like. <laughs> and suddenly, oh, let's go here. <laughs> She, we got preferences. It's just, we just like things. <laughs> I put a spotlight on Anna, but you can't see her. So I just did it anyway. So we're prone to everything with partiality. We, we do that. People often will decide on what church they want to attend according to their partiality. Does this church have the programs I'm looking for? Is it big enough? Does it have a coffee bar? That's some of the materialistic kind of things that some people try to look at for a church. I've seen guys, uh, though, with, with partialities towards people. I've seen guys before, Christian guys, ready to give the gospel, 
and they will give the gospel to a good looking girl, but not anybody else. Partiality. Oh, they're ready to give that girl that gospel. When we process our Christian walk according to how we feel, then we're going to fall short. We'll fall short every time. But James wants us to understand that we can't do this with our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot have this partiality in the faith. You can't do it. Because if you do it, it will become sinful, biased behavior. And so when I see James open up by saying, my brethren, it's like he's saying, hey, what I'm about to tell you, don't process, don't process this in your mind. Take it down to your understanding of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit of God and you'll get the right understanding. My brethren, believers of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality, don't hold your faith with partiality. In other words, don't show favoritism. No favoritism. God does not show favoritism, and so to be like God, we should not show favoritism either. Jot down beside your Bible, uh, scratch pad or something if you have it, I hope you do, You've got time to go find one. I want you to uh, understand that Romans 2 and 11, also Ephesians 6 and 9 says, there is no partiality with God. There is no partiality with God. Colossians 3 verse 25 says, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. You know, when God judges, he is not going to let some people get off easier than others uh, just because maybe they had more money or a higher stature in life. He's not going to judge, well, you were a better guy and you were, I understand the reward system, but the partiality is not there. There's no partiality with God. Judgment will be fair with God, there is no partiality. Now, why is this so important that God shows no partiality? Maybe some of you are hearing this for the first time, that God is not partial. Why does this matter? Well, if God was partial, if God was partial, then that would be very bad for us, I believe. You know, as a Gentile, I think about the blessings to Israel and the things God offered to Israel and all these things you see that is for Israel. And I often think that as a Gentile, I figure if God was partial, it seems to me that the Jews would be saved and I could not. But God's not partial. There's no partiality with him. Jew and Gentile, Jew first, and then to the Gentile, both can be saved. There's no partiality with God. I can somewhat relate with Peter in Acts 10. Peter found out that Gentiles can be called by God too, not just the Jews. And that's when Peter said in Acts 10, jot it down again. I, hey guys, I want you to go back and read this stuff. Okay, I know I'm moving fast, but this is recorded. You can go back and check it anytime you want. I want you to check this stuff. Anna's putting it up there, thank you. Acts 10 and 34 says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. That's why it's so important that God is not partial. It has everything to do with us being able to be saved. Okay. Just because it's what it is, is, is everybody getting the repeat loop three times? Travis is getting it, but is other people getting that? If there are, I can't really do anything about it, I don't think. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to keep going. Uh, maybe refresh Travis and come back. Uh, I'm hearing from other people they're not getting that. Is anybody else getting what Travis said? A repeating three-time loop. Yay, coronavirus. Look at us. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, he's, Peter realized that God shows no partiality. And that means a lot for our, in relation to our salvation, that I can be saved, a Gentile can be saved. 
So uh, at that time, there was a period of time when the Jews thought that God only was there to save just them and that he was only their Messiah. But Peter discovered that God was calling other nations too, not just Israelites, not just the Jews. Uh, Gentiles in the room, can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Aren't you glad that we can all be saved, every one of us? It's not, it's not a partial thing. You know, sometimes the, the jealousy was that maybe some people would say, well, that's our Messiah. That's our Messiah. Well, hey, he's my Messiah too. So glad. But Peter discovered that God was calling other nations too, not just Israelites, not just the Jews. With God, there's no partiality. And I'm very thankful for that because it means I can be saved too. And I'm so thankful that God does not think the way we do. Aren't you? Yes. God, thank you that you don't think like me. <laughs> Isaiah 55 and 8. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Now, we're very partial on everything. God is not partial like that. And so with the Lord being sinless, he has no sin. James has to open up his letter by saying, my brethren, in other words, to my fellow believers in Jesus, you're going to have to listen to the indwelling Holy Spirit to be able to understand this because it's backwards from what you're accustomed to. This is backwards. What James is about to tell us is very different than what we use, are accustomed to functioning at. So let's get back into James' words here, but let's go into it with the direction that he's asking us, not by our own logic and our own feelings, but with an understanding of what the Holy Spirit is going to give us. You know, if you're truly saved in Jesus Christ, you will have changed. You can't be the same old that you've always been. There had to be a change in you. You're gonna think different. There's gonna be things you perceive differently. And that's the Holy Spirit giving you that. So let's go to the Holy Spirit for the understanding of what James is about to tell us. So don't process this, this in your head uh, because a lot of people might get offended at some of this stuff. That's because you're processing it up here. Listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you in your heart. James is addressing believers, my brethren, he says. And so he expects us to draw from Holy Spirit understanding. James 2, verse 2. He gives an example. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool, you ha have... Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That don't sound good, does it? Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're showing partiality depending upon how rich the guy is. You're, you're passing a judgment based on evil thoughts. Okay, now this is what I was getting at earlier, how people misuse their faith impartiality, such as people I've seen who only share the gospel with those pretty girls, but they won't share the gospel with someone else. Because you know why? It's because their real agenda is they want to get close to that pretty girl. And I'll use the gospel to get close to her. The gospel's not the main point. It's the pretty girl. See, the evil thought, the selfish agenda. They're misusing their faith with partiality. Don't misuse the faith like that. So people like this will witness to a pretty girl in a heartbeat, but they'll never witness to a poor beggar on the street, will they? It's preferential. It's favoritism. It is partiality. And James said it is evil. James said it. It's evil. You become judges with evil thoughts, he said. Now, while we're on the word judge, because I, I know what people think about when they hear the word judge, what they hear is don't judge me, don't judge me. And it's always from a negative angle. And I wanna to touch on something about the word judge real quick, because I think we need to understand the word judge to better understand what James is getting at here. Um, our culture today, 
has mistakenly perceived the word judge to be nothing but a bad word. And it's not always a bad word. It just depends on how you use it. You can use things for good at various items you can use for a, a good purpose or a bad purpose. I could use a hammer to build a building or use a hammer to tear one down. It just depends on my heart, my angle, my purpose. Uh, everybody likes to run to the verse that says, judge not. You ever had people do that to you? Judge not, Ray, judge not. I've had people do that to me. But they don't know the full passage <laughs> when they go to that judge not verse. It says in that passage, I'm just paraphrasing, uh, the judge not verse, what it talks about, it says to first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will have clear vision enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So what that means is we're actually supposed to judge. We're supposed to, oh, I can't believe you said that, right? Well, listen to the way I'm saying, I'm which kind of judgment here is what we're getting at. The, the biblical issue at hand here is which standard, which way are you judging? Jesus said in John 7, verse 24, I want us to understand judging here. Jesus said in John 7, 24, he says, do not judge according to appearance, the poor man and the rich man. That's what James just talked about. People, they got judged difference, accord, differently according to how they looked. He says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge, see that? But judge, he said, judge with righteous judgment. So the judge not, judge not, actually we're supposed to judge, but we're supposed to judge with righteous judgment. Don't judge based on what it looks like, um, how it looks to you. Judge by righteous judgment. So Jesus said we're supposed to. Judge means to decide. When's the last time you made a decision? <laughs> okay, that's judging, deciding. Judge means you decide something. You come to a conclusion about something. You weigh it out. When you go out to eat, you look at a menu and you judge the menu. What am I gonna eat today? When you decide you wanna go on a uh, vacation, you research a bunch of destinations and judge well, this one from that one, which one you wanna visit. You're, you're determining, you're trying to come to a conclusion about something. When you meet people and coworkers and friends, you try to get a bearing on what kind of person they are. Not just by what they look like, but their character, you're trying to judge what kind of person they are so you know how to work with them. It's okay to judge. It's okay to do that. But don't judge according to appearance. Judge with righteous judgment. That's what he said. Jesus said that. So what did Jesus mean when he said that? It means you first have to be a believer in him because belief in Jesus brings the indwelling Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit. And then you need the Holy Spirit to even be able to know what righteous judgment is because I know that's the question people have. Well, if it's okay to judge and I'm supposed to judge by righteous judgment, then what is righteous? You need the Holy Spirit to know what that is and you need to pray and you need to be in God's word. That all combines will teach you how to have righteous judgment. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Can't even know it, guys, without the Holy Spirit, because they are spiritually discerned. Discernment means what's right and what's wrong. Which way? Now, this is why James began, I think, by saying, my brethren. He's expecting his audience to go to this Holy Spirit understanding because we got to weed out this bias that we all carry. Guess what, guys? You carry a bias. You really do. We all carry a bias. Even though this world makes us think we're conditioned to not be judgmental and all these things, we all carry a bias. Something has shaped you one way or another. we got to get rid of that. and we got to judge righteously. So he said, my brethren, go to the Holy Spirit of God to understand so that you would be able to understand what he's teaching. So, Got to have the spirit to do that. You've got to be in God's word. You've got to be reading it. I know a lot of people that have a Bible and they claim to have reverence for the Bible, but they never read it. You got to be in it. You got to breathe, don't you? You got to eat. Well, you got to be in God's word. You also got to take that in all the time. I know people that they will eat three times a day 
And if they miss a meal, oh, they're feeling it, but they haven't eaten spiritually the word of God for years, and they're starving to death. You gotta be in the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture, some scripture, all of it, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture. And so do we judge? Yes, we do. Jesus said for us to do so, but not by appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. For those of you that misuse the judge not verse, whenever you hear somebody try to warn you about the dangers of your sin, they're trying to call you to repentance and you go, oh, judge not, judge. And that's the only verse you seem to know. <laughs> um, you really ought to read the entire thing. You really ought to read the whole thing before you use that. Know what that is you're messing with before you throw it out there. You need to know what it says. Refusing to repent in itself is a judgment. If you get called to repentance, you oh, judge not. I'm not going to repent. I'm not. That's a judgment you made too. You judged not to repent. And it is not a righteous judgment when you do that. And so the word judge is so thrown off in most people's understanding. And I just wanted to elaborate real quick about uh, what the word judge means because James is telling us how to judge. He's, he's telling us don't use partiality. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to further what it means to judge righteously. Now look back at James 2 verse 4 again. He said when, when you show partiality to the rich man over the poor man, you become what? He didn't only say judges. He didn't say you only become a judge. He said you become judges, what? With what? With evil thoughts. Judges with evil thoughts. Jesus said judge, but he said judge righteously. Now, what did James say? He said, when you do this like you did to the poor and rich man, you become judges, not righteously, with evil thoughts. The evil thoughts is driving the judgment the wrong way. It's, it's driving it to partiality and you can't have partiality with Christ in your faith. Righteous judgment is what we need. Now the problem is with most people is that's not how they judge. They judge wrongly, like what James is warning about. They judge with biased, partial, evil thoughts. Most judgments go that way. There are those out there that demand, I, I'm not picking on anybody anywhere in any church, but I've been to places before, they demand you wear the full-blown suit and tie to church. I've been there. Now, I'm not wearing a suit and tie, and I've had people tell me I'm disrespecting the Lord. I'm not wearing trashy stuff. I'm not wearing things that, that exposes myself in any improper way. But there are people that will look at you the way you dress and they will judge how you dress. Especially if you came into a church. Now, what was the example we got here with the poor man in the filthy rags? It says he came into the assembly and, and, and somebody misjudged him. And James said that was wrong as evil thoughts. Now, um, this... Dis, dis, uh, disrespecting God according to dress style. It, it can go too far where it's, I get it. It, it. it can go away where it shouldn't be, but it's just not biblical to look at somebody and prejudge preemptively with evil thoughts, strike them out of the way just because that's their clothing they have. Rich man, poor man. That's the example James gave, guys. That's the one he, he used. So, according to James 2, a poor person with filthy clothes is just as welcome in the assembly of believers as somebody wearing a three-piece suit, the poor man or the rich man. When both of these men walk into the assembly and you treat the rich man with honor and the poor man, you make him get out of the way, go sit over here, go sit at my footstool, but oh, rich man, you take this wonderful place of honor when you do that, then you have judged according to appearance and not by righteous judgment. If you look at both of these men with righteous judgment, you'll see they're both people that Jesus Christ died for. And I really had to get over this in my life. I really had to get past this, 
this bias because we got certain people groups in our culture today that we look at and we go, oh, he or she's one of them. Oh, I can't talk to that person because, oh, because of what they do. And then we judge with evil thoughts. Now, James is illustrating this, the bias issue, the, the sinful favoritism that people have when it comes to their own personal opinions about other people. And when you treat the rich man well and the poor man with resentment, then James asked the question in verse four as a question, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, the reason James is asking it as a question, he didn't say you do become, he's asking, Don't, isn't that what you become? Evil thoughts, he's asking. He's a, he wants you to go down and ask the Holy Spirit, is that what I am when I do that? You, you gotta realize the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, that's what you are. He's asking you, he's, he's getting you to go process, process that. You know, it's kind of interesting how James is teaching us to not have a bias by telling us not to go here. <laughs> Get rid of this bias and go to the heart, go to the Holy Spirit. That's a good bias to have. A good way to do it is to get this, get your head out of the equation because you can't figure it out anyway. So go into the Holy Spirit with the understanding that all believers have so that we can come up with the affirmative answer that we are guilty of partiality when we judge with evil thoughts. Cut and dry now, remember, Jesus said to judge with righteous judgment. Judging with discrimination and prejudice and all these favoritism things, that causes division. Mm -hmm. That starts division, not only out there in the world, but even in the body of Christ. You ever been through a church division? Doesn't feel good, does it? That's what starts it. It's where people start pressing a bias of favoritism within the church. James 2 and 5, he says, listen, my beloved brethren. Oh, look who he's addressing again. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Wow. Okay, again, James is begging for the ears of believers. Listen, my brethren, he says. You know he's not meaning Jews when he sees brethren because there's been times before when somebody said brethren and they meant Jewish people. But I know that he means everybody, Jew and Gentile, believers, because he's talking about no partiality, okay? So he means all believers in Messiah Jesus. No partiality. This, so this word brethren means believers of Jesus, he asked. Listen, I'll, can I say the same thing? If you really truly believe in Jesus, can I ask you to listen to what James is saying? Listen to this. No partiality. He asks questions. He puts his, his points forward as questions. He asks questions to show them how their partial judgment was wrong. First, he talks about how God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. To be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. That's big, heirs of the kingdom. Those that Jesus died for are poor. Okay, now this doesn't mean if you got a lot of money in your bank account, you can't be saved. I'm talking poor spiritually. As sinners, none of us, none of us were rich enough to buy our salvation out of the mess that we got ourselves into. When we sinned, we got in a terrible mess and ain't not one of us had enough spiritual currency to buy our way out. Matthew 5 and 3 says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Isn't James Jesus' brother? Okay, didn't, didn't Jesus say this? Now, I, what I see is James is teaching something that agrees with what his brother said. 
<laughs> Jesus said this, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so you can see now how his brother James is agreeing with what Jesus said. To imagine that at one time, there was a time when James was not a believer. He didn't believe that his brother was the Messiah. I mean, think about it. What if your brother said, I'm the Messiah? You'd have a hard time believing that, wouldn't you? Put yourself in James' shoes. But now, after coming to belief, thank God, James, the brother, came to believe in Messiah Jesus. He is now furthering Jesus' teachings by agreeing with what Jesus said. I just find that fascinating. <laughs> Has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Now, as I said, all of us are poor, are poor because we were all dead in sin before we came to belief in salvation. And so to think that the God of all creation, of the whole entire universe, the king who has exceeding riches would come to save us, would come to save me, the poor and the dead who fell into sin, to remake us new and alive again. That just blows my mind. And it makes me wanna say hallelujah to that. Yeah. Remember, God shows no favoritism. If he judged us like we would judge the rich man and the poor man, we couldn't be saved. Those who walk around like they're the best thing on the planet, like they're really something. And those that think they know it all and have it all, that's not poor in spirit, guys. That's pride. That is pride. And God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so James is trying to rattle everybody's memory here, his audience that he's writing to. He's trying to remind them of times when the rich came and dragged them into court. It says they slander and blaspheme the noble name by which they were called. He's speaking to believers. He's saying, believers, you remember that time when the rich people came and dragged you into court? You remember when that happened? They blasphemed the noble name by which you were called. He's trying to flip the story to where the people who have been through this kind of oppression can think back and remember, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, I know, I know what this feels like. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? Now, what name is this? What name is this that James is talking about? What is this noble name? The name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. Those who have, he's writing to believers, my brethren, those who have submitted their lives to Jesus, when they get dragged off into court by these rich people who are trying to oppress them, they are blaspheming the name of Jesus. Wow. Now, anyone who had been through this kind of oppression before would have said, yes, that's so wrong for them to do that to me. That wasn't right for them to drag me off into court like that. They would have felt it. What James is saying is that it is just as wrong for you to dishonor the poor man who comes into the assembly as it was for the rich to drag you believers off into court to dishonor you. He said it's the same thing. The way you treated that poor man that came in that's exactly the same thing when the rich people dragged you off. And so now I think any believer who was listening to James would have been, oh yeah, I know what it feels like now. James is trying to flip the story to get the believers to think of what it felt like to the poor man who was dishonored. What James is saying, it's just as wrong for you to dishonor that poor man who came into the assembly as it was for the rich people to drag you off into court and dishonor you. James just painted a really sharp parallel there, didn't he? A really sharp picture. He, he, he's, he's trying to get the people to see what it feels like to be dishonored like that poor man was and how easy it is to become just like the ones who instigate this kind of evil because we all carry a bias. We all carry a, a, a preference. We all carry a favoritism and how quick we are even as believers, if we don't think from the Holy Spirit, if we think from our own selfish bias, how fast we fall back into that favoritism, don't we? We do. James readers here would probably, they would have to agree and recognize that insulting the poor in favor of the rich, whether it's done in courts or if it's done in the church, it's wrong. It is sinful wrong. God shows no favoritism we should not either. 
And while we're on this subject, let me say that this does not only deal with those who are poor, but how about those whose lifestyle, I'm, I'm getting into our modern culture here. How about those who are in a lifestyle uh, of a sort that is stereotyped by us as being inferior or wrong? Would you refuse to share the gospel with someone who belongs to a group that you consider in your sin nature to be less than you, to be inferior to you, below you, according to your favoritism. When you look at that person of that stereotype group with favoritism, do you, does it drive you to say, I'm not sharing the gospel with that person because favoritism, you stand off to the side. You ever done that? You ever done something like that? I'll tell you, um, it's hard to go share the gospel to somebody that you used to consider or maybe part of your sin nature considers to be repulsive or undesirable to be around. I'll tell you, I, I've had to swallow down a lot of old prejudices over the last number of years. I have had to do that. Prejudices that my culture taught me to have because I had to swallow it for the sake of carrying out the gospel, because I have to be ready to tell anybody, anyone who would ask or who I have opportunity with. But when you see that person that makes you uncomfortable, or they seem to be that type of person that will have nothing but friction with you, or maybe your thought is, well, they're, they're not my style, or I don't mix with that type, or someone you just simply rather not talk to, if, if you listen to all the negative reasons that this world has taught you about them, and if you treat them less than anyone else who is just as entitled to hear the gospel, if you treat them less than that, then you judge that person not with righteous judgment, as Jesus told us to do, but you judge them according to appearance. You judge them with evil thoughts. You know, I, I was coming out of a store one time and there was a homeless man who was off to the side. He was sitting down. He had a, a, a whiskey bottle and he, he was not clean. He didn't smell good. He was wearing terrible clothes and he, was, he had a filthy mouth on him. And the Lord said, share the gospel with that guy. <laughs> and you know what my first initial reaction was is I don't want to. I don't want to. I mean, come on, be honest. In that privacy of your mind, you think like that because we have a bias. And I said, Lord, I don't want to. He, he looks like he'll probably argue with me. He's drunk. He won't remember anyway. Blah, blah, blah. All these reasons to not do it. I was looking at him according to his appearance and I was judging him with evil thoughts. I was using favoritism in my faith. You can't do that. And so I shared the gospel with him. And you know what? He listened. And for all I know, he could be saved and in a totally different place now. I don't know. Haven't seen him since. I'd like to think it's because he got saved and some things changed in his, mind, in his life. I don't know. But why, how about you? When you have the opportunity, and it, but it's that kind of person, I, I, I don't want to do it. Because it, he, he's one of those people. Or she's one of those kinds of people. Are we using favoritism? We shouldn't. We're all judgmental. We have to be. It's called thinking. You have to weigh out decisions daily. You have to do it. But imagine how much wonderful work we can do for the kingdom of God if everyone would turn their judgment scale around, if we would all switch from selfish evil thoughts to judging according to righteous judgment, as Jesus said. Imagine what we could do if we would do that. When you are prone, prone more likely to dishonor people because of their social status, then you risk blaspheming the name of Jesus. Did you catch that? If your life demonstrates righteous judgment, then when that poor man comes into the assembly, then you won't be one of those who sets him aside to show favoritism to the rich people. I have a pastor friend 
It's interesting. My friend, Pastor, uh, Pastor Eddie, Eddie, I hope you're okay with me saying this. He may be watching. He's probably doing his own sermon right now. Uh, Pastor Eddie, um, he, he's a friend of mine who is a Calvary Chapel pastor. His church at one point went down to zero attendance. <laughs> his wife showed up and that was it. And he would preach the sermon to his wife like it was 100 people. He would preach to her. And every Sunday he preached to just her. But finally one day a poor man came in. This poor guy showed up and he preached the word of God to that one poor man as he would have done to a whole full church. And there for a while though, that one poor man that attended, that one poor man carried that pastor along as his congregation. And so you never know who that poor man is. You never know who he is or what God is gonna do through him. Because right now, that same church has a lot of people. I went there not long ago and preached, and there's several people. That one poor man carried that pastor as, a congr with the congr as his congregation for quite a while. Look at what that one poor guy did. But had we, or had Pastor Eddie judged him wrongly with favoritism according to appearance, chances are that church wouldn't be there today. See what happens when we do this wrongly with favoritism. If you show partiality towards him, you commit sin, which is exactly what James tells us next in James 2 and 8. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, I told you it's going to be kind of a sort of a long uh, sermon today, but I'm, I'm liking it. I hope y'all are liking it too. Let's see some hearts. We're, we're live. We're doing this live. Give me, there you go. I'm seeing hearts. Good. Okay. <laughs> this live thing is kind of cool, you know. <laughs> okay. James made his point just point blank clear, didn't he? Love is right. Favoritism is sin. Pretty easy. If you show partiality, you commit sin. And you notice how at the start of verse eight, James gives what I call the if clause. If, what if? The if clause. He said, if, means some people won't. <laughs> he says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture. Uh, you know, what's funny about the if clause here is that as sinners, none of us can really do this, but if you really do fulfill the scripture, I mean, the reason he's saying if is because you can't, you can't fulfill it. He's saying if you could. <laughs> See what James is saying? If you could fulfill this, but if you really do fulfill the royal law, according to scripture, you do well, okay? This is what the if clause is all about. James is stressing that this standard is so high. It's so high for us to be able to, to keep it. It's almost like there's no way. That, that you can keep this. And the reason he wrote this if clause is because if he, he's anticipating a response from his readers who at the time knew that the law was written in Leviticus, but it was affirmed by Jesus Christ. Written in Leviticus, affirmed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 23, I'm sorry, Matthew 22 and 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what James is referring to. With all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second, here's what James meant, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Okay, okay. <laughs> Whew, that's heavy. The law hangs on this whole thing. Love in the Lord your God all the way and others as you do yourself. The whole law hangs on that, guys. It hangs on the whole thing. So what James refers to as the full royal law, according to scripture, the whole law, all of it. Jesus said that on these two commandments hang all of this law and the prophets. And so this is why James is stressing the need for us to have no partiality. 
That's why no partiality. People are texting me and it's blocking stuff. Get out of the way. Stop that. There you go. <clears throat> I'm back. Okay. This is why James stressing us the need to have no partiality because if you show favoritism to one person while dishonoring the other person, then you become convicted by the law. The law then now convicts you as a transgressor of it. it means you sinned. This commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you people out there really love yourself? I mean, I am, ooh, I am all that. Do you look at other people the same way you think of yourself? James is reminding us this law is royal. It's royal. It was decreed by a king. It was decreed by the king of kings. It is a law fit to be decreed by a king, and it is the king of all laws. And the reaction that James is shooting for is for us to become obedient to this law by having a non-biased love for other people. Oh, Ray, there's just some people I just can't love like that. Well, you need to forgive them. Especially if somebody did you wrong and you've got this boiling hatred of anger, you got to forgive them, get rid of it because it's driving, that unforgiveness is driving partiality in you. And then that makes you the transgressor, not them, makes you the transgressor. See how important forgiveness is? So we need to have an outer display and outer evidence that we truly belong to Jesus as his people. When you show prejudicial pre uh, favoritism, preferential love to some people while, while dishonoring others, you break God's law through disobedience and become a profaner, a blasphemer of Jesus' name, the noble name by which many people are called. You know, it's not good to dishonor a believer that profanes the name of Christ. You know, some people may be thinking, well, I never say GD, but they dishonor other believers. That's still profaning the Lord. Just the same. God shows no favoritism. Let's be reminded of that. But also realize if God did show partiality, if he did, he doesn't. But I'm saying if he did, then God would be guilty of breaking his own law. Because James says, if you do this, you are a transgressor of the law. God shows no favoritism or he'd break his own law. And God can't do that. He can't break his own law. He's the one that wrote it. God cannot be a transgressor because God would be a sinner. God has no sin. 1 John 1 and 5. We're getting there, guys. Hang with me. You're at home all nice and comfy. We can do this. You've been at home for almost a month. We can do this. <laughs> I know we're running long. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. None. Some people like to blame God as though he's doing bad things. There's no evil in God whatsoever. You wanna blame God? Maybe you need to stop and think about yourself where you are in this. Now, if upon salvation we are forgiven and made sinless, then that means our payment had to be made by a sinless sacrifice. Makes sense, doesn't it? That sinless sacrifice was Jesus Christ who was sent by our sinless God. And so if you want to walk a life of righteousness like Jesus, then we have to get rid of all the biases. You gotta get rid of those biases and also get rid of those prejudices that the world is constantly trying to put into us. Think about it. When you turn on the news, what do you see? Oh yeah, there's issues going on, but what's the real thing you see? What you see is a bunch of people looking at the other guy, judging them with evil thoughts and throwing accusations. That's all I see. That's what you see on the news. People are learning how to be judgmental. The world that says judge not, they're being judgmental with, evil thoughts. Because all I hear about is this group, that group, I don't like them, I don't like him, I don't like the president, blah, blah, blah. That's not good judgment, guys. 
This means Republicans, stop hating and dishonoring the Democrats. This also means Democrats, stop hating and dishonoring the Republicans, if you're believers anyway. Well, I'm a conservative, Ray. I'm a conservative, and, and those darn liberals are destroying this country. The liberals are destroying the country. I've heard it the other way around. I've heard people say, well, I'm a, I'm a liberal, and the, and the conservatives are destroying the, you know, the... The Democrats think the Republicans are destroying the country. The Republicans think the Democrats are destroying the country. I'm going to tell you what's really destroying the country, guys. Sin is destroying this country. That's what's doing it. It's not political at all. Never has been, never will be. It's sin is destroying the world. It's a dying world. It's already had, it's taking its toll. It's decaying. It's not savable. Matter of fact, God's going to do away with it. We're going to be taken out of here. <laughs> so sin is destroying the country and the world, whichever side you stand on. Now, I understand there are policies that are evil and, and, and there are some policies that are good, but guess what? Both sides have them. For the Republican, oh, I'm a, hey, I get it. I've heard Republicans do evil things too. I mean, it's, it's all out there. There's a, there's a big mess, but whichever side you take, I'm not here to talk politics. Whichever side you stand on, whatever your political or economical or ideological or whatever your theological position is that you cling to, as a believer, you have no right to dishonor anyone while using your favoritism as a justification to make it okay. You don't get that right. It's evil. James said so. Friends, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You lose the right to tear people down. Well, well, yeah, but they did. No, don't try to justify it. Don't dishonor them. You will become a profaner of the name of Christ, possibly, if not a transgressor of the law. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, when he said that, he did not, act, he did not add a justification back door to it. He didn't say, love your neighbor as yourself unless they don't deserve it according to your opinion. He didn't say that. He said, don't do it. He said, don't do that. Love them. That's all he said was just love them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, your neighbor is a lot of different kinds of people, right? Even the ones that you would rather not associate with, that's your neighbor. We have got to get a hold of exactly what it was that he commanded us to be doing. Love one another, period. That's what he said. Anything less and you become a transgressor of the law, guilty. Well, Ray, if you understood my background and how I was raised, then you'd understand that anytime I see that kind of person over there, no, verse nine says, if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Well, Ray, back in my day, anyone that banded together with those people, we were right to go out against them. And verse nine says, if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. I don't know how many times I need to say this before we finally get it. <laughs> Well, Ray, just because you believe that doesn't mean I have to. Verse 9 says, show no partiality if you commit sin and are con you're convicted by the law as transgressors. I know how bad people hate and they try to twist in their justifications to make themselves defend, to try to defend their behavior and think what they're doing is actually okay. And I also know that people are calling the conduct of Christians as being hate. I know they're, they're twisting it around backwards and upside down. But that's all confusion talk. That's Satan language. That's all it is. Whether you agree with this teaching or not that James is giving, we're almost done. Whether you agree with this teaching or not, this is the written word of God. Is everybody seeing this in James 2? I hope you're seeing it. It's the written word of God, which one day we will all answer to. And we will have to stand before the Lord and give an account to and nobody's going to hold your hand that day. There's going to be no recourse. You can't sue God. 
You can't run your justifications in front of him. He's not gonna listen to it. He's not gonna show favoritism for you over someone else. The one and only way that we sinners have for going forward and being able to survive as transgressors at all is by submitting your life under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you got out. Get under the blood he spilled to pay for your death penalty and obey his commands. You know what? If you don't know what his commands are, how can you obey them? A lot of people don't even read. You got to know what's in there. Obey it. Don't be a blasphemer of Jesus. Be a follower. Be obedient to what he said. All those old prejudicial biases that you carry, they've got to go away. They have to leave. You actually block the love of Jesus Christ unto others when you react with partiality. They can't see it. Well, Ray, I may not be so good at this favoritism stuff, but God knows my heart. God knows my heart. I've heard people say that. <laughs> yeah, he does know your heart. Problem is, is it a selfish heart? But Ray, I'm a good person. God is not going to hold against me for this one issue here. Just for this one little issue, God's not gonna hold it against me. That's why James said what he said next in James 2 and 10. He says, for whoever shall keep the whole law. Woo, look at me, I'm good, I'm keeping the whole thing. Whoever will keep the whole law yet stumble in just one point. He is guilty of all. He is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, James knew that people would work really hard to try to dismiss their prejudice. Well, I get to keep this prejudice because of what happened to me here, because the way those people are, I, I, I get to keep that. I get to keep that. I'm going to keep that prejudice. I'm going to hate that certain person. They're going to try to keep their, their, their prejudice as some kind of trivial thing. Like, well, just because it means a lot to you doesn't mean I, I should get as gung-ho as you are about it, Ray, or you, James. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep it. I hear that kind of response all the time. People always tell me, just because you're a Bible thumper, Ray, doesn't mean I have to be. <laughs> oh, I love it when they say that. Because, man, we got a conversation now. <laughs> Not everybody wants to do like you do, Ray. No, they don't. I, I get it. But this is not about doing things like I do. This is about doing things like the way God tells you to do. This isn't Ray saying this. This is the word of God. It's not even James. It's the word of God saying it. When God gives an order and you say no, when God tells you to do something, you say, no, I'm not gonna do it then that means you become a transgressor. You sin. It means you don't love God. It means you're not loving him by saying no to him like that. Even if you swear that you love him, saying no, uh-uh. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I tell you? Jesus asked that question. Suppose you have an employee and you tell them to go do something and they say no. What do you do? You tell them to do something, they say no. What happens? You penalize them in some kind of way. You either will give them a warning or you eventually fire them because they refuse to do their job. Now, James and myself are throwing out warnings. That's what he's doing with this word. That's what I'm doing teaching this. We're throwing out warnings. We're, we're trying to show you warnings before God fires you. What? You gotta do what your employer tells you. Guys, we gotta do what the King of Kings tells us to do. We're trying to show you, those of us preaching this word, we're not being hypocritical because we're accountable to the same thing. We're trying to show you salvation so that you can be saved. You can't get to salvation in Jesus by insisting on doing things your own way. And so for those who are still clinging to their justifications for keeping partiality, holding on to your reasons for why the entire word of God pertains to everybody in creation except you, <laughs> realize that James said with the power of God, uh, the, 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 he said it with the power of God breathed scripture that whoever stumbles in just one point out of the entire law, just one point, 
they become guilty of the whole thing. All of it. This is what it looks like under a God of no favoritism because he's not going to deal out any special favors for certain people. Nobody gets any special exceptions. If you can't perfectly keep the entire law, then you're guilty of the whole thing. And James used the most extreme cases to make this point. He used adultery and murder to show us how absurd it is. When we try to make our preferred sin have a special exception over another sin. Apparently someone in James Day thought they were really top notch above the rest of everybody else for having never committed adultery one time, but had murder under their belt. Well, I've never committed adultery, but yeah, I've committed murder. How do you make one sin look better than the other like that? Because the same law that said don't commit adultery also said don't commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery, but you do murder, then you have become a transgressor, which means you broke the terms. You went outside the border of the law. Now the law needs to be viewed as one big package. And here's where I'm going to try to wrap it up. Okay. So y'all hang with me. We're still going. I don't know how far we're into this, but this is good stuff. The law needs to be viewed as one big package. It can't be like the pastor who saw the husband and wife come in. He said, well, I hadn't seen you in a long time. Where have you been? And, well, pastor, uh, me and my wife keep the Ten Commandments. I keep seven of them, and she keeps the other three. It doesn't work like that. The whole thing's one big package. <clears throat> you violate just one part of it. You violated the whole package deal. Well, this doesn't sound fair to me. Well, it's like when, let me explain. It's like when you're going to get a job. And you have to negotiate a set of terms with the employer. You establish what work you're going to be doing, where the work's going to be performed, how much pay you should get for doing it. So imagine you're at this interview and the employer agrees that you'll be doing this certain kind of work. The work will be done within certain guidelines at the place of employment. And you should be making, let's say, $50,000 per year, just for example. So you agree to those terms. You agree to those terms. So you go in on the first day of work in the established location of work and you start doing the, the type of work that are in the terms of your contract. But when payday comes, they decide they're not going to pay you $50,000, but they decide to pay you $25,000 instead. What are you going to do? Are you honestly going to let them tell you, but we only violated just one part of the contract there's a lot of things in the contract. That's just one part. No, you violated the whole thing. I'm not getting 50,000 like we were taught, like we agreed. They violated one part and the whole thing's off. It's not going to work. And so James said, whoever keeps the whole law, but stumbles in one point, he's guilty of the whole thing. He has transgressed all of the law. Now, maybe you're thinking that's not fair. Oh, here comes the gospel. You might be thinking, well, that's not fair. I can't keep all that. It's too impossible. It's not fair. I'll tell you what fair is. Here's what fair is. Fair is we sinned. We should all go to hell for it. That would be fair. That would be fair. But God offers us grace, not fair. He offers you grace. He offers you a way out. You can be saved by grace. You can't be saved by fear. So Ray, what you're saying is if I fail in just the slightest little piece of God's law, <clears throat> one little part, that means I blow the lid off the whole thing and that means I'm gonna go to hell for just blowing one little piece. Yeah, that's the way it is. You're thinking, there's no way I could ever be good enough for this, Ray. There's no possible way I could do this. If you're thinking like this, you know what I say? I say, hallelujah, because you're finally starting to realize the need for a savior. Amen. If this concerns you, I can't do that, Ray. It's too big. It is too big. If this concerns you, listen close. Romans 8 and 1 says there is therefore now no condemnation. Did you hear that? 
no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Jesus Christ will make you free. Well, I can't uphold the law. That's why you need to get under Jesus Christ. Four, verse three, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law that we could never get up to, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's good news. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, Mr. Kenneth Merrill, we have. Friend, the requirements of the law are set too impossibly high. And I think this is why some people misunderstand God. They don't know the word, they don't read, they misjudge with evil thoughts. Yeah, the law is too high. That's why you need a savior in Jesus Christ. He took care of that. He took care of it. What the law couldn't do, God did through Jesus. Friend, I, I pray that you are finally realizing, somebody somewhere that may watch or hear this, that you're finally realizing you need a savior. You need a savior in your life. Without Jesus, you're guilty. Not just of one, but all of it. Without Jesus, the entire package deal is blown. You need your Messiah. And to finish up, I wanna to go to what Chuck Smith once said about favoritism. Chuck Smith, who started the whole Calvary Chapel movement, he said this, he said, faith keeps me from getting judgmental about the weaknesses of others because I know that apart from God's help, I'm just as hopeless as they are. Only through faith in God can I make any progress in my Christian walk. Father, we come before you in prayer, Lord. What a good message. Uh, Lord, it's hard for some of us to process this because it's so big and it's so deep. And Lord, we've just got biases. Some of them we know what they are. Some of them we don't. Lord, I pray that you get all of them out. That the next time I see somebody that has that appearance that I don't wanna share the gospel with them, or nah, I'm not. Lord, that we don't look at them by appearance. We think we judge by righteous judgment. And Lord, for those that go, but what is righteous judgment? Well then Lord, help them to get in, the, in your word and study more and pray more and grow that faith by hearing of the word to understand what righteousness is. Because Lord, the pe people are saying, well, what's really right? What really is truth? With fake news, what's really true anymore? Your word is true, Lord God. Help your people see that and to go by that. Lord, strip us down of our biases. And Lord, it's gonna require a sacrifice on our part. We're gonna to have to give some things up. Lord, the next time we see that, oh, I don't know person. Oh, I don't wanna to talk to them. But Lord, if you tell us to share the gospel with them, Lord, help us to go and do it. Because that one poor man, that showed up at that church service to my friend. It carried that church for a while. You never know what they're gonna end up being. We don't wanna profane your name, Lord Jesus. We don't wanna be a transgressor of your law. And so we cannot dishonor people based on their social status or their money or, Lord, we just have these biases. They, we need to get rid of them. So Lord, I'm asking for anybody hearing me, anybody here today that, we start reviewing what our prejudices are, what our biases are, what our favoritisms are, and Lord, that we just get rid of them and start looking at every scenario and every situation and every person through righteous judgment that we learn from our Lord Jesus Christ and your word. Forgive us, Lord God, and I ask you to help us with that. So we cannot do it. That's why James said, brethren, believers, we gotta go into the Holy Spirit understanding to get this. There's a lot of people out there that are lost, Lord God, that they don't understand, but we do because you gave us Holy Spirit discernment. Teach us how to show them the love that Christ commanded us to have. I don't wanna be a transgressor. I don't wanna be a profaner of your name. And we thank you ultimately, Lord God, for the salvation in Jesus Christ. 
that you did not show favoritism towards us because if you did, I couldn't be saved because I sinned. You would have said, you sinned, you're done. You're out of here. But you didn't look at me like that. You saved me anyway. Even though I was a filthy mess, you saved me anyway. The royalty of a king saved a sinner like me. So Lord, if you can do that for us, we can do that for other people too. We can go to them and despite what they look like or however they may seem to us or whatever stereotype group they may belong to, they are not too far down for us to share the gospel with them that they could be saved and come to repentance and gain eternal life. Help us with this, Lord. This is a tall order. <laughs> We're a messed up people full of biases. Only through you can we do this right. I thank you for it. Thank you. You didn't leave me. You stayed and you came down and you saved me. Let's go out to other people with the gospel. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, how long was that? I don't care. It was good. So thank you all for being here. Um, let's see a few more hearts. Pump it. Pump the hearts. Get them. All right. Does this thing keep track of how many hearts? Because if I'm not getting enough hearts, I'm going to push harder next time. Anyway, whatever. Thank you all for being here. Um, guys, we really had to just figure it out. There's a lot of... St Good thing, Mr. Merrill. Thank you. Dutch Shepherd. I know who you are, Dutch Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> Dutch Shepherd. <clears throat> All the way over across the pond. That's Dutch Shepherd. Awesome. Thank y'all so much for Good being day. here. And we will see you next time if we have to do this again. Bye-bye.